So in the last video, we talked about the cross-coupled pair oscillator. And we said that if you have something that looks like this, so we've got a, uh, a resistor and inductor and a capacitor. And then we've got that on two sides. So resistor, inductor, and capacitor. And we said if you connected this to a cross-coupled pair, so here it's just a simple NMOS cross-coupled pair, um, if you could do this, and we said that, uh, let's assume that these two transistors are matched. Uh, if we have R is equal to one over GM, times one plus one over GMRO, or approximately R is just equal to one over GM, then we said that this circuit would oscillate. And so the, the trick now is how do we actually translate this, uh, this circuit specification, if you will, uh, so let's R, L, and C, how do we actually translate this into a physically implementable circuit? So the first question we need to ask is where does this uh, where does this L, C, and R actually come from? Um, well, in the case of the capac or in the case of the inductor, first of all, uh, we put this there. So we physically have to take uh, a piece of metal, a spiral piece of metal, typically, and place it somewhere on the chip. So this inductor is typically going to take up a lot of the chip area. Uh, but we're going to get to choose its value. We're going to get to choose uh, what it looks like, et cetera, et cetera. The capacitor, in contrast, is usually, uh, we, we don't want to introduce any more components than we need to. So the capacitor is usually due to parasitic capacitances. And so which parasitic capacitances? Well, if we draw all the parasitic capacitances of this circuit, um, so let's draw them out for both MOSFETs. So if we say that this is M1 and this is M2, then we've got, we know we've got a CGS capacitor, we've got a CGD capacitor. Uh, what else do we got? We got a CDB capacitor, and we're going to assume that the body is tied to ground here. And we've got these on each side. So since we're assuming that the MOSFETs are identically match, the capacitors for each are going to have the same value. So CGS and CGT. Now the trick here is identifying which capacitors go where. Um, so this, uh, if we're talking about the small signal circuit, these VDDs up here, uh, these just become grounds. So we know from small signal analysis, any signals that don't change with time, any signals that are constant become ground. So any capacitors connected between this node and ground uh, will contribute to this C. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna erase this real quick because we don't actually introduce a capacitor. It's just entirely due to the parasitics. So which, which capacitors go well go where? Well, uh, the first one is fairly obvious. Um, there's uh, this CDB. So this capacitor on the right, um, I'm just going to redraw that. Uh, let's call that C total. Um, C total on the right is just equal to CDB uh, plus what? So what other capacitors are in parallel with it? Well, it's not this CGD, at least not, not exactly. Um, Oh yeah, fuck. What do I, what do I need to do for that? <laughs> so next, if we take a look at this CGS capacitor on the left, and we track this capacitor, so we see 
that this wire is just the same thing, the one that I'm drawing over continuously. And so this CGS capacitor is actually one end of it is connected to ground. So one end of this CGS connect capacitor is connected to ground, but the other end is actually connected to this node over here. So the C total for the right hand side um, is CDB plus CGS. And it's the CGS of the left hand side. So if this if these uh, if these MOSFETs were mismatched, then we'd need to worry about which capacitor goes where. But since they're matched and they usually they usually are, then we'll uh, we'll make it easier on ourselves. Okay, let's erase the capacitors that we've already accounted for. So let's erase CDB. Let's erase let's erase everything that we've already accounted for. And so we're we're assuming that. Uh, or we, we know that C total on the left is going to be the same as C total on the right, assuming these capacitors are matched. So the only thing left is we need to deal with these CGDs. Um, well, if we do a similar thing and we kind of track the connection, so we, we recognize that this capacitor is connected here and we track it over to this right-hand side, we'll see that this capacitor is actually connected like this. It's connected between these two sides. And so is this capacitor on the right. So if we track this guy over here, we'll see that it's connected also between these two nodes. So we can represent both of those capacitors by a single capacitor between, between each of those nodes. So I'm just going to erase them because they're connected, they have the, exactly the same connections, so they're, uh, they're, they're the same, same capacitor. But what do we do here? Because this, is, this isn't a capacitor connected between ground, it's not, uh, we, we can't immediately say that it adds to C total. But remember, we said in the previous video, this is a differential circuit. And what we mean by that is it's got symmetry. So if there's any voltage on this left-hand side, say this voltage is V1, I don't care what it is, but it's V1. And there's a voltage on the right-hand side, that must be negative V1. Doesn't matter what V1, what V1 is, because this is a symmetrical differential circuit. So we say that this capacitance, 2CGD, um, if we're looking at this node, so if we're looking at V1, this acts like a capacitor. Since this capacitor has a voltage drop of 2V1 across it, because it's, oh, this is getting kind of messy. So this capacitance value is 2CGD. And this capacitor has a voltage across it of 2 times V1. Well, that capacitor has exactly the same amount of charge stored on it as if there were a capacitor at node V1 with value of 4 CGD. So the same exact charge would be stored on the capacitor. All the voltages in the circuit are the same. All the, all the currents are the same, except the currents. Um, there's no current flowing now from this node to this node. Um, and similarly, it acts like a capacitor of value 4 CGD on the right-hand side because we haven't disturbed any of the voltages or any of the currents because we're saying that for any value of V1, uh, this capacitor can equivalent be, equivalently be represented uh, by a capacitor of value 4 CGD on either side. And that's a somewhat heuristic, intuitive argument. Um, the way that you'd actually prove it is with Miller's theorem. Uh, and you can show that this capacitor is, these two capacitors are exactly the same as the two CGD that we saw. And I went over this in a previous video as well on the cross-coupled pair itself. And so the total capacitance on each side we need to add 4 CGD2. So this is our total parasitic capacitance, at least due to the MOSFETs. The inductors are also going to have some parasitic capacitance. But you should know what those are um, because you're the one designing the inductor. So this is 
this is how we <clears throat> this is how we design our or this is how we identify the total capacitance in our circuit. And now we know that the total oscillation frequency or the oscillation frequency omega, the frequency of oscillation, is just going to be one over the square root of L, <clears throat> which we introduce times C. So we can set the oscillation frequency by setting this inductance, which is cool. Um, now one last one last thing we want to go over is a practical consideration. Usually we want these to be controllable. So to be controllable. So we don't just want to plop down these oscillators. Oh wow, that's that, that was a bad spelling mistake. I must be tired. Uh, controllable. So we don't just want to plop down this circuit in the middle of an of an IC. We want we want to be able to control it uh, with some external voltage, some kind of signal. So what we do is we add. So let me just redraw it here real quick. Got our inductor, our capacitor, and our resistor on each side. These are connected to VDD. And notice that I'm kind of cheating because this capacitor isn't actually connected to VDD. Uh, but since the small signal operation is what causes the the oscillation, um, that that doesn't really matter. And there may be there may very well be a capacitor that's connected to VDD. Oh, my MOSFETs are facing the wrong way. Man, I'm I'm just I'm off my game this evening. Okay, so we draw the MOSFETs the correct direction. So instead of just connecting these directly to ground, what we're going to do is we're going to add a biasing current source. Call this ISS. What this does is ISS sets the maximum current which can flow through one of these MOSFETs. So at most, we can have ISS flowing through one of these MOSFETs. It might be flowing through this one, it might be flowing through this one, and it's gonna oscillate with time, but it has some maximum value, which means that the current through this resistor uh, will also have the same maximum value of ISS. Because when this inductor and capacitor are at their at their peak, exchanging uh, exchanging current, no current is going to flow through the the resistor itself. So the maximum differential voltage, so the max voltage is now determined by ISS. And typically ISS is gonna be a transistor, which we can control. So we apply a voltage to the transistor, different voltage applied to the transistor, different ISS. And so this is just one last one last detail that, that we add just to make this oscillator more, more workable. And so that's it. You now know how uh, cross-coupled pair oscillators work. And there's various uh, variations on this basic structure, but these are these are the fundamentals. Um, this is this is the idea behind the operation of most of those structures. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you do, if you did, please like and comment below, and I'll see you guys next time.